Well, good morning and welcome to St. Paul United Methodist Church. Thank you for joining us for this time of worship, whether you're here in person or worshiping with us online or possibly even by radio in the parking lot. And we are glad that we can gather together to worship God. And so as we begin, let's open up in prayer. So let's pray. Almighty God, we thank you for today. We know that each moment of life is a gift from you, and so we give you our thanks and our praise. And as we gather together, whether here in person or online, we pray that your Spirit will be poured upon us. Open up our hearts to you, and may you be honored and glorified in this place. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Hey, well, let's stand as you are able and let's sing our praises to God. And if you would, please leave your mask in place. Yeah. 
You may be seated. And welcome once again to St. Paul. Uh, my name is Pastor Clifton, and it's always a joy when we can come together to worship Almighty God. So no matter what has been going on in your life throughout this past week, we are glad that you have chosen to be with us as we gather together to worship the one who loves us the most, Almighty God who is with us. Uh, there is a link for an online attendance pad, and so for those of you who are worshiping online with us, you're invited to click that link to let us know that you are here so that we can encourage you on your journey of faith. But there's also a way for you to provide any uh, prayer requests or concerns that you may have with us, and so please do so and just be assured that we will be praying for you. Our missions committee, our missions and evangelism committee, will be meeting next Sunday at 3 o'clock, but they do present you an opportunity today, and that is an opportunity that we have been given to help our health care workers. It's a program that is put on that's entitled Be a Hero to Our Health Care Heroes. And we have been designated three west at the hospital, and so these are 18 workers that we want to bless uh, with some... Um, tangible items and also notes of encouragement. An email will be sent to the congregation with more details as well as being placed on our Facebook page. And so please be on the lookout for that and then join in in presenting different items as well as notes of encouragement. Our weekly events have continued or are beginning again in person. They began this past week and will continue both with tonight with youth and also middle school Bible study and then other events during the week. If you are usually a part of a study group or a Sunday school class, just please be in touch with your leader and they will let you know when their class will begin again, uh, whether that's going to begin in person or online. Well, let's continue in our worship of God through our giving. Uh, we have finally finished all of the financial paperwork from 2020, and so please let me express to you my thanks and appreciation uh, for your faithfulness. Uh, you gave very faithfully to support the ministries here at St. Paul as we make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. And so thank you for your faithfulness. We were enabled us to finish the year strong and start this new year of 2021 on a firm uh, financial footing. However, our building fund has seen a significant decrease in funding during this past year. Our current indebtedness is roughly $95,000. That means we make a monthly a payment of $3,000, whereas throughout 2020, we only received roughly about $2,000. And so we do invite you and encourage you to give both to the operating and the building funds to help further the mission of St. Paul. Uh, you may do this online with the online giving link that is provided or by texting your donation or by making the designation for the building fund on your check or the offering envelope. Uh, but let's continue in our worship of God through our giving. Uh, as we do for those who are worshiping in person, there's an offering plate at the back of the door, and so as the service concludes today, you're invited to place your offering before the Lord there, or you may stop by the church office uh, on Mondays between 1 and 3. But let's continue in our worship by going to God in prayer. And so let's quiet our hearts before God. I'll lead us through a prayer, and then let's pray together our Lord's Prayer as we pray. Most gracious and most loving God, we gather together to sing your praises. We gather together to worship you, to come before you, to bring to you all of our hurts and pains, our worries, our fears, our sorrows, our heartaches. We come to you simply as we are believing, taking those steps of faith to believe that you see us, 
you know us deeply, intimately, and that you care for us, for you love us, that it's in you, Lord Jesus, that we become your precious children. And so pour your Spirit upon us, minister to our hearts, and hear our prayers. We pray for all those who have recently lost loved ones. Today we remember Melissa Block and her family and the loss of a close family member. And we ask for your grace and your mercy, your comfort to be with them. We also pray for our older members of our congregation. Many of them are being isolated and are lonely, and so grant them your presence. Hold them close to you. We pray in particular for Bobby, for Georgia, and Francis, among many others, that you will comfort and strengthen. We also pray for all those in our church family and in our community who are dealing with COVID-19 virus and its many effects. And so we ask for your grace and your mercy, your healing and your strength. We also pray for all those others who need a healing touch of your powerful hand. And today we lift up to you, Bob Compton. We pray that your spirit will be poured into our lives afresh so that we can live our lives in a way that honors you, that furthers your kingdom, so that truly we will live our lives in a way that pleases you. Help us, Lord Jesus. And so we join together in praying the prayer that you taught your followers, your friends, your disciples, as we pray together our Lord's Prayer, as we pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, the children are now dismissed for Children's Church, and it's the time together with Mrs. Amy, and so you're invited to follow her at this point, and we'll continue in our worship of God through the reading of the Scriptures. This morning's scripture is from the Gospel according to John, chapter 11, verses 17 through 26. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him. But Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live, even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? The word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Well, today we are continuing our series that we began at the very first part of the year. And it's a series that it's entitled, Knowing Christ. 
moving beyond the babe in the manger to know Christ and to know him deeply. And so as we've been studying in the series, we've been looking at the Gospel of John and looking particularly in how Jesus describes himself, not looking at his miracles or what he did, not looking at necessarily even his teachings, but looking at how he describes himself. And in the Gospel of John, what we see are seven different phrases where Jesus describes himself by saying, I am this, I am that. And so we began the series several weeks ago by looking at that first I am saying where Jesus said, I am the bread of life. And how Jesus is telling us that he is enough for our lives. That he is enough. That we can find contentment in our lives in Jesus. And then we looked at Jesus being the light of the world and how he invites us to follow him out of darkness to follow him into his light. And then we looked at Jesus saying that I am the gate and how that was that invitation for us to put our trust in Jesus and to follow him on that narrow path that leads to life, life in all of its fullness and life throughout eternity. And then last week we looked at Jesus' statement, I am the good shepherd. And how Jesus invites us to come to him, to listen to his voice, and to follow him. Well, today we're going to continue on. And the story is that story about Lazarus and his sisters, Mary and Martha. It's a very long story, and we only read part of the scripture. And so let me just set the scene for you in the story. It's in the Gospel of John chapter 11. And so if you have your Bibles, feel free to turn to it. The story is it's in its entirety of chapter 11. And so let me just share the story. Basically, Jesus was good friends with Lazarus and his sisters, Mary and Martha. And at different times, if you know your Bible, you know that we'll run across these three again. But they were friends, and Jesus is traveling in a different place, probably one day's journey away, and he receives word that his good friend Lazarus is sick, and they are inviting Jesus to come, presumably to come and lay his hands on Lazarus and heal him. And Jesus delays. He, he waits, and, and we're not positive why he waits. He explains it that he waits so that we will be able to see the glory of God, so that his followers will truly believe and see something miraculous and deepen their faith and belief and trust in him. But he waits. Now, he does eventually get to the town where Lazarus and Mary and Martha lived, But by the time they arrive, Lazarus has already been dead four days. Martha runs out to him, and that's our primary text. And then we see Mary coming to visit Jesus. And then we see that wonderful miracle of miracles that Jesus goes to the tomb. And he tells them to roll back the stone and and Martha The ever practical says, well, why would we do that? There's going to be a a terrible smell. He's been dead for four days. And Jesus says, roll it back. And then he calls to Lazarus to come out. And this dead man who is still wrapped in the grave clothes, he comes out alive. Okay, that's our context for the story. That, that's a context for the statement of Jesus describing himself. Now, the statement is, of course, the statement, I am the resurrection and the life. All right, so what do we see? Well, first we see about the resurrection. It, it's that guarantee of a life to come. It's a guarantee that there is more to life than this. It's a guarantee that after death we'll be raised to new life. Now let me just share a part of that with you. It's verse, 
21 to 26. I want to read that again to you. It's when Jesus has already arrived. Martha finds out and goes to Jesus. Martha says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Now, we don't know whether Martha truly believed that Jesus could raise her brother from the dead. But she put some type of faith in Jesus, some type of trust in him. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And that was a very devout Jewish belief is that there would come a day of judgment. And at that last day, it would be a day of resurrection when the dead would rise to new life to stand before Almighty God. And so here what we have is Martha declaring a true statement that would align with her faith and would align with her Jewish teaching, would align with what Jews believe, that at the day of resurrection, on that final day, the dead would rise. And then we have Jesus' statement. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing me will never die. I am the resurrection and the life. What we see is Jesus declaring that promise that truly it's in him that we have life. That one day we will be raised to new life. That no matter what happens in this world, no matter when our death comes, that we have that promise that as we hold on to Jesus, we'll be raised to new life will be given that eternal blessing where we're brought into God's presence forever and forevermore. That sickness and death will not have the final say, but that truly Jesus has that final say. I love how he phrases it just a few verses before in John chapter 10, verse 28, where Jesus says, I give them eternal life. And they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of our hand. It's that assurance that we have life in Jesus' name. That as we trust in him, we are given that eternal life. That no matter what happens, we know that we are given eternity in God's presence. I read a story this past week and let me give you the man who I was reading. It's by a man by the name of Walter Baxendale. And Walter Baxendale tells a story about a churchyard cemetery in Hanover, Germany. And he said, in the cemetery, there's this one famous tomb because it's one very large. It's a, it's a sepulchral where there's massive stone steps going up to the doors to the tomb, and, and they've put heavy iron bars and chains and a lock on the doors of the tomb. And they've engraved the tomb not only with the family names, but they've also engraved it with this inscription. It says, This sepulchral, purchased for all eternity, is not permitted to be opened. Now, what this tomb, why it's very interesting is that there is a birch tree that has grown up from probably a little tiny seed that just happened to blow in there in onto the steps, and it's broken apart the steps, and it's even broken those iron bars and that iron lock, and it's broken the tomb open. Jesus has promised us life. That when we put our trust and our faith in him, that we are promised that resurrection. That no matter what happens in this life, we are assured, we are promised, we are guaranteed that we'll be brought in the God's presence for all eternity. Now when we have that promise and, and we begin to hold on to that promise, 
then it begins to change how we live in this life. And, and that's where Jesus' statement saying, I am the resurrection and I am life truly begins. Because when we have that assurance that we are accepted by God and that we'll spend all eternity with God, well, then it begins to transform how we live our day-to-day -day lives. It, it creates in a new perspective on life. It means that we don't always have to be first. We don't always have to have the recognition. We don't always have to reach to the top ladder. We don't always have to have our name in lights. We don't always have to put ourselves first. But truly, we're able to serve God. Whether anybody sees us, we're able to do what's right to really help others regardless of the bottom line. I love how C.S. Lewis puts it in his book, Mere Christianity. He phrased it this way, he says, If you read history, you will find that the Christians begin the most for the present world are just the ones that thought the most of the next. The apostles themselves who set on, out on foot in the conversion of the Roman Empire, the great men who built up the Middle Ages, the English evangelicals who abolished the slave trade, all left their mark on earth precisely because their minds were occupied with heaven. It is since Christians have largely ceased to think about the other world that they have become so ineffective in this. Aim at heaven and you'll get the earth thrown in. Aim at earth, and you'll get neither. It's when we hold on that Jesus is truly the resurrection and the life for us, and we hold on to that, then it begins to transform every part of our lives. It begins to transform our minds and our actions it transforms how we interact with others. It transforms our goals and our desires. Well, it transforms our life. The Apostle Paul phrased it this way in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16. He says, Therefore we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light is, and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. As I think about this, uh, this concept, this reality of placing our focus on truly what is eternal and how that transforms today. The, the one person that comes to mind to me this past week was a woman by the name of Joni Erickson Tata. Have you all ever heard of Joni Tata, Joni Erickson Tata? Uh, she had a wonderful ministry uh, beginning in probably the late 60s and still goes on today. Uh, her ministries are under the umbrella of Joni and Friends. And they have begun not only in the U.S., but now have gone to many different nations all around the world. In particular, she has ministries that reaches out to those who are disabled. Because early on in her life, when she was in her late teens, she had a tragic swimming accident that paralyzed her. And yet, she didn't give up hope. She saw that she could still be used by God to be a blessing to the world. I have a video clip of her, and I want us to watch that. It shares more about her life and her view on eternity in her own words. And so let's watch the video clip. She saved me. But for what purpose? For what reason? Because now lying there in a hospital, doctors told me I was going to have to sit down for the rest of my life as a quadriplegic without use of my legs or, or even my hands. My hands don't work. And I remember thinking, God, is this, is this your idea of an answer to a prayer to be drawn closer to you? If it is, you're never going to be trusted with another one of my prayers again. 
I mean, I'm a new Christian. How could you have taken me so seriously? I sank into deep depression. I, I remember there were wonderful Christian friends who came to the hospital and they encouraged me. And one Bible verse they shared was from Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11, where God says, I know the plans I have for you, plans not to harm you, but to help you, plans to prosper you and to give you a hopeful future. God, you, you mean you plan not to harm me? Well, what do you call quadriplegia, huh? What's that all about? As I read that verse and the context around it, I realized something, that when God said that, he was saying it to his children who were being dragged away into captivity by, by the Babylonians. They were going to exile, they were going into slavery. They had decades in front of them of hard, awful suffering. And I began to see that God's plans for a hopeful future for me was not necessarily jumping up, dancing, kicking, doing aerobics, running, walking, getting back use of my arms and my legs. No, God's plans for me go far deeper, a deeper healing, a precious healing of the soul. Because as I was pushed into the arms of God every morning, and that's the truth, even to this day, don't be thinking I'm an expert at quadriplegia. But as it was then in the hospital and as it is today, every morning I wake up saying, Jesus, I can't do this thing called life. Please help me. Please show up. Give me your smile. Give me your strength because I can't make it through the day. And because I go to God with that earnest dependency and, and requirement of His grace every single day, I take that back. No, every single moment I experience the sweetest, most precious, most intimate union with Jesus Christ. So in Jeremiah 29, when God says He won't harm us, doesn't mean the body, doesn't mean our circumstances. He's not going to do anything to harm our soul. Yes, our body may get harmed, but it will somehow serve to enrich our soul. In closing, let me just say that quadriplegia 46 years of it, that's a long time. I deal with chronic pain. I, um, I had breast cancer a couple of years ago, and I remember, I remember as my husband was driving me home in the van from chemotherapy one day, we were talking about how suffering is like little splashovers of hell, kind of like waking us up out of our spiritual slumber. And then we were pulled in the driveway and he said, well, then what do you think splashovers of heaven are? Are they those easy, breezy, bright times where everything's going your way, where you have health? And we said, no. Splashovers of heaven are finding Jesus in your splashover of hell. And to find Jesus in your hell is ecstasy beyond compare. And I wouldn't trade it for any amount of walking in this world. midst of Lazarus dying, his sister Martha goes to Jesus and comes to him. Jesus responds to her, I am the resurrection and I am life. Do you believe this? Now Martha, she responds in verse 27, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. She takes that step of faith to declare and put her trust and believe in him. But not everyone did. Even after the resurrection of Lazarus, it says that some believed in him, but then it has this foreboding story in verses 49 onwards of how the religious leaders gathered together and they plotted Jesus' death and said, this man cannot live. We have to get rid of him. And so let's look for a way to kill him. When you hear that Jesus is the resurrection and the life, how does that affect your life? How will you respond to that message that you are given that promise of eternity? that you are given that guarantee of that eternal life with Him, 
but it also transform your life here. Do you believe that? How do you respond? Let's pray together. Almighty God, we thank you that you love us enough to send your son Jesus. And we thank you, Lord Jesus, for declaring who you are, that you are the resurrection and the life. As you gave Martha the strength to declare the truth, empower us with your Spirit so we will declare that in our hearts and in our homes and in our lives so that we will hold on to you, Lord Jesus, no matter what is going on around us, let us hold on to you so that our lives will be truly transformed and honor and glorify you. Do all that you want with us. We pray this in your holy name. Amen. Let's join together in singing a song of praise. And so you're invited to stand as you're able for those worshiping in person.
Let's pray together. Dear God, thank you for today. Thanks for giving us this time where we can gather together to worship you. Send us from this place with your Holy Spirit, with your blessing resting upon us so that we can hold on to you as we go throughout this week honoring and glorifying your holy name. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, thank you for worshiping with us and have a great week. For those who are in person, you're invited to be seated and then an usher will dismiss you in a moment. Thank you.